So good afternoon, everybody. The toughest spot to have, huh? After lunch. And uh, the only way I can entertain you is I've asked all my panelists to tell us a whole lot of stories, a lot of brand examples, a lot of uh, real life campaigns that they've taken alive, or taken live, and what's worked for them. So I hope we can keep you awake while the stomach rumbles there. Um, I have an esteemed panel here with me, and uh, we're going to talk today about uh, brand identity expanded to brand messaging, brand, brand personality, brand values, and how essentially can you have your brand consistently represented across the different channels that um, you know the brands are today using. And uh, uh, you guys want to quickly, uh, you know, give us, we have just quickly the names, introduction, and then we will start. So you know exactly who we are talking to. Uh, my name is Varun. Um, I oversee marketing at LiveSpace. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Sneha here. I lead brand and social for the food delivery business at Swiggy. Hey folks, I'm Ritij. I am a senior brand manager at Phone Hey guys, I'm Rahul, co-founder of Tamada Media, one of the largest content production and creator led companies down south. Hi everyone, I'm Harshna and I head marketing for Bluestone Jewelry. Hi, I'm Akshay. I'm the CRO for Tyru Media. Thank you. So, um, you know, as marketers and as uh, experienced uh, people who have probably taken your brands across different channels through different new product introductions and things like this, what is your approach to um, an omni-channel presence or, you know, choosing multiple channels? What are the challenges you typically face when you're putting together a, a strategy like that? And uh, what are the opportunities that you've been able to leverage? The question is open to all the panelists. I'd like two, three of you to come in with some examples here. I think it's primarily starting from uh, what it's one. Go ahead. Yeah, it's one. I think it primarily kicks off from who the folks you're trying to reach out to and what are they doing. Because a lot of it is actually coming down to Mike. A lot of it would come down to the media consumption habits that the audience that they are trying to cater to for each of the campaign. Like sometimes you might want to reach out to slightly younger folks, so your media choices would vary. And let's say if you're reaching out to let's say a slightly older cohort, your choices will again vary. So it's kind of coming down to who you want to drive the message across to and what are their touch points primarily. Uh, Ritish, wouldn't that also be what your brand wants to say to those touch points? I mean to those uh, audiences? I think you, you customize according to those touch points is where I'm started. Because uh, there's obviously a constant message that you want everywhere, but you've got to adapt that message to the touch point as well, right? I cannot say the same 20 second story on a, let's say, a TV ad, or probably if I've got a longer form of communication, I probably cannot do that in an offline universe. So a digital OH won't cut it. So a lot of it will have to stem out from, hey, I've got this message, here's a touch point, how do I kind of customize according to this one? So any specific challenge that you've come through? Uh, across when you're trying to you know go across three four channels i think the challenge is probably having a better planning funnel because you got to i think it's not very very difficult to customize everything because if you're in it i think with proper planning you can kind of sort it out because again you wouldn't want to lose out on the right folks at that very touch point so you got to plan for it instead okay yeah just want to add there um, you know there are brands who are looking to, you know, be at channels which where their uh, customers are, right? And typically, uh, we've seen social channels which are, uh, and just adding to what you're saying is that we've seen typically brands when they come up, they they have, you know, their communication, everything sorted out. But when it comes to certain channels which are new for them, they they don't have. Uh, the right kind of assets, etc., and the communication that needs to go for that channel itself. For example, you know there is Snap, right? Snap. Uh, it's very high on augmented reality and you know engagement levels, etc., yes. over there. But when brands want to utilize those channels, uh, they struggle uh, in how do they translate their current communication into maybe augmented. Into an engagement point there. Yeah. It's a very valid uh, point, Akshay. I'm going to definitely come back and get an example from you over here. Um, Sorry, Tina, just one yes. point to add. So I think in addition to what Ritij said, right, about who do we want to speak to and like what you said about what is it that we want to talk to the consumer, I think one challenge that we face is in really measuring 
uh, how it's done, right, versus the objective. So I think in addition to who you're speaking to and what you want to tell them, uh, it's also very important to have the objective in mind. What are you out there to do, right? Are you trying to get more consumers? Are you trying to engage them? Because accordingly, we can also measure how the campaign has performed, how each channel has performed to drive that objective. So uh, I think both parts of it. Having the objective in place is an important part of the framework that we have. and. It is a challenge to measure how it's doing as well. So absolutely. So uh, maybe you know, uh, Harshni, can you spend some time telling us about the constraints that you face when you're looking at Omni Channel? Oh uh, yeah. So just to add to a few points, uh, apart from what already everyone mentioned, is when we think of a brand like Brookstone, which is truly Omni Channel by itself, right? We have 170 plus stores currently, and we started off as an online brand. The uh, biggest challenge that uh, we also face is at a brand level, um, we have decided what our story is. We have created a campaign. We are using multiple channels to, um, you know, communicate that. But the essence of it starts from the DNA of the employees, right? When you talk about 170 plus stores, you're talking about hundreds and thousands of uh, retail employees, you know, meeting customers every other day. So are they aware of the brand identity, the tone of voice, right? So the brand and marketing, um, um, work doesn't stop only at campaigns, but also how the, the, the brand ethos, the brand identity trickles down to each employee, uh, whether it's the customer care uh, representative or the retail staff, which where it's important for the customer to feel and experience that also when they, um, you know, uh, experience the brand at different touch points. Um, the, the, the products, of course, are very important. So um, giving you an example of our um, campaign that we launched around the last festive season, uh, it was called Love is in the Little Things because we believe in um, celebrating little moments, uh, right? And the product itself was an innovative um, watch jewelry, right? So uh, explaining that to um, the employees as well, to talk about the essence of the campaign when meeting customers or interacting with customers also is something which is important. When so I'm going to go in a little bit over here because what you're talking about is a watch jewelry. Yeah. How do you bring across the brand persona and what the brand stands for in a product like that which is so difficult to talk about across channels? Yeah. So it was challenging but it was extremely exciting and we were loved for that campaign and the product itself. So. Um, Thinking about jewelry, right? Um, mostly traditionally, we um, have Sanjay Leela Bansali sets in those ad films. Women clad in, you know, lehengas and saris, top to toe, um, yes. you know, almost like um, choking in jewelry. And um, what we realize that the customers that we are catering to, they're young, they're cosmopolitan, they um, don't need a occasion like wedding or childbirth only to fla flaunt their jewelry, right? So how can we? Uh, and of course, they are all tech savvy. Most of them are watch, uh, using smart watches. And how can we use that wrist also to for them to um, you know flaunt their style statement? And that's where this concept came out. And that's why in the ad film also we showed a couple um, again showing the power dynamics of today's couples, where the woman was fit running, she uh, very comfortably uh, you know finished the marathon, and the husband was slightly unfit, and she was motivating him. And towards the end, when he finishes the uh, the run, he you know, gives a small piece of watch jewelry saying this is our first marathon together. So talking about how the occasions also, right, um, can be <coughs> anything, it doesn't have to be big occasions only for a, a category like jewelry. And for this itself, when we speak about Omnichannel, we went to movie theaters, uh, we um, did TV campaign, we started with HD, we went to SD as well. Um, of course, the challenge was also how to, um, tran uh, you know, translate the film into a static for print sure. or for outdoor, yes. right? And uh, also how to tell the story in the shorter edits of the digital uh, requirements, right? So these are some of the challenges as well when it comes to one uh, campaign, but so many formats that we need across channels. Um, can I bring Varun into this right now? And uh, you know, so constraints very well put across over there. But budget also sometimes is a constraint. So have you ever faced a situation where you've been forced to leave out a channel which was, you know, actually helping you tell your story and brand experience better? Okay, I've never come across a marketer who's told that I have sufficient budget. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> uh, to be honest, budget is always a constraint, right? Yeah. Um, but going back on the point, um, yeah. which even Harshna mentioned, for a brand like Live Space, yes. right? uh, we are a digital first brand. 
right? And the audiences whom we gathered first or reached out to first were uh, audiences who are digital savvy, right? And therefore, the need state for that audience is very, very different and unique, right? They're higher risk takers, for example. Once you start switching channels, right, um, in media, you start seeing different personas. And therefore, is the brand, uh, have, uh, does it have the right cap category, uh, right catalog? Does it have the right stores, for example, in this space? Does it have the right designer to cater to those needs? And at the end of it, are we communicating it in a manner which you know, reaches them as well, right? It's probably the ads which we run on digital might not cater to the audiences who are on TV, for example, right? You might have to customize them because the motivators, their barriers are very, very different from the other set of audiences. That's very true. So also you might have a different product lined for uh, different categories of uh, purchases. Absolutely, right? yeah, yeah. The need state is very different. For example, just to give you an example, right? Um, let's take Bombay. If we go to Borivali, hmm. the audiences who are in Borivali are predominantly Gujaratis, right? Heavy, heavily populated by Gujaratis. And the need state from a design perspective, right? From materials, colors, finishes are very different from, let's say, Andheri. Which is just down the road, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, it's uh, it's personalization at a micro market level, um, and not even at a city level, right? So then, how does your brand say the consistent thing across all these different kinds of audiences? Yeah. So what LiveSpace has done is um, uh, from all our brand tracks, right? What's come out is that the largest you know barrier for people to enter this category is the quality of material and quality finish. So uh, we had to stick with one message, and that's something that we have stuck with. And consistency has paid off for us, right? Actually, for the last four years, we just invested in you know quality of material, quality of designer, quality of finish, uh, because LiveSpace is doing a category creation job. LiveSpace entered the market when Organize was about two percent market share. Today, Organize is about twenty-five percent market share, right? twenty to twenty-five percent, right? So uh, that's really paid off for us, and we, as a result, we have significant market share in the Organize space. Give an example of something that you might have had to do. In terms of uh, planning content for a different, uh, you know, category of audiences. Yeah, that's Can a challenge. Uh, yeah, you know, so for example, let's say you run a campaign on, say, digital platforms. Right? Say, let's say social, Meta, uh, Instagram, um, and say YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you have to run a campaign on TV, the audience sets are very different, right? And therefore, I'm not sure if they resonate with the same comms. Um, probably you might have to uh, tweak your comms, the personality has to be different, um, cultural nuances are very different, uh, there's a lot of differences, it's not something that we've been extremely successful at, but I think uh, there are some brands who have done it beautifully, right, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Any of the brands so, but, come to mind? You want I may actually yes, add to that, please. actually, uh, yeah. I think we come from a very different perspective, right? Yes. So as an agency, Down South has been helping a lot of brands enter the South Indian market, so Tamara Media has been the brand custodian to help them do that. I guess you're absolutely right, right? Considering that there are so many different markets just down south, right? And then each platform behaves so differently, each channel behaves so differently. To find your audiences where they are is becoming increasingly challenging. And I think that's typically where, if you take for example, we work with two dating apps for example. Both of them very, very different. One that has been wanting to kind of, you know, uh, reach out to women and one that's been wanting to reach out to men, right? Okay. And how we were able to kind of crack this is considering one has a very tier A approach, one has a very tier B approach. So who do we pick? What is the brand aesthetic? What does the brand want to communicate? What is the, how do we keep the messaging consistent across all of these channels has been a huge challenge. Whereas for another brand, it was a, a tier two approach, by this was a tier one approach. So I guess it is absolutely right in terms of trying to find that consumer at the right time, at the right place, is becoming extremely difficult. And even as platforms, every platform we have different like Instagram, YouTube, whatever, Twitter and LinkedIn for example. Yes. Uh, you know, I just want to ask you something, Rahul, you and I were talking earlier and you gave us a good example of one of those dating apps. I hope I have all your attention here because we're talking yes, about the interesting category. Yes, we've done some great work for uh, Bumble where, you know, the campaign was about women make the first move. So, um, so women make the first move in a tier one may yeah, work. Does it work in tier two? <laughs> so, uh, but another app called Friend, okay. which is you know very tier two focused, and you know are having a different set of audiences. I mean, the aesthetic of brand is different. That's yeah. very very different. The the whole brand identity then doesn't, or do you drop that channel? Do you drop the geography at all completely? 
Yeah, would the brand have to do that or how do you take it with the same essence of women make the first move? How do you take it to tier two? Did they take it? So basically, uh, so each brand has their aesthetic and what they want to do and what they do not want to do as well, right? So I guess that's something where we come in to kind of, you know, pick what are those channels that are actually relevant to a brand. It's not necessary that every brand should follow every channel for every campaign that they do. So there have been, for example, with uh, Bumble, we also done a lot of uh, outdoor ads. Right? Okay. So they actually kind of after the campaign they followed it up with the creators who were just budding to kind of put out hoardings. Okay. Because it's a more urban tier one kind of a campaign. Okay, just out of curiosity asking all of you and uh, I know Akshay and Rahul you would have helped brands do this. Uh, what would come first in your pick of, uh, you know, is it branded content? Is it channel driven content that you would take or data driven content? What would come up in your uh, approach? I think, uh, I would say data driven content makes a lot of uh, sense and just adding to and it has some link to what he was also talking okay. about. It's a multi-channel uh, scenario and within the channel also, uh, you know, the audience behavior is completely different and that is powered a lot by the data that you get from, you know, all the omni-channel okay. sources, the yeah. CRM, etc. that you get. For example, uh, we have a platform called Wittech, right? Okay. And we've multiple times seen uh, in campaigns that when a campaign is running and a certain product is or a communication is being uh, communicated to a user, what is being shown and by what, because of which the user is actually going into the store, uh, say it's an e-commerce store, he ends up buying something else. So there is a set communication or a, a you know a brand uh, push that is going, but they end up buying something else. And this is a correlation that, you know, through data you can figure out, hey, you show this, maybe this sells more. Uh, and, you know, that's Fair, but then I would say the brand has actually missed a touch point there in translating what it stands yeah, for. That's true, that's yeah. true. But, and hence, brand specific may work. Just, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. And one point to add here is also when we were talking about the dating app and uh, tier one versus tier two, it also depends on what's the brand objective here, right? Are we trying to um, introduce a change in consumer behavior or are we trying to fit in with whatever changes we can make Absolutely. in the brand identity, right? Very so valid. that is also a choice we need to make that while uh, trying different channels and trying to be truly omni-channel, you can't dilute the essence of what your brand stands for, what's the messaging and what the service or product stands for. So it is a fine line and um, uh, I think it's Would very important to stay true to your brand also absolutely. while catering to different kinds Plus of Plus 100 things. to that. Uh, but give us an example, Harshini. Can you think of something that you would have, um, any brand that's done it successfully? Uh, something um, you I think uh, right here, <laughs> Swiggy as well as uh, Zomato, right? Okay. When it comes to their brand identity, they are not diluting. They have changed consumer behavior in the last few years, right? Um, of course, um, COVID did help, but before that also, I think it's beautifully done trying to um, add um, a new layer to consumers' lives, right? Which uh, all of us as e-commerce or D2C brands are also trying to do. So some of the, for me, Swiggy and Zomato are doing great across channels, keeping their brand identity and ethos. Absolutely, uh, I think I want to come in here, Sneha, about an example that you would like yeah. to give us. No, so uh, specifically to answer your question about data versus channel, I think it's a very hard pick. Because it's a very hard pick. Uh, you need the data to find out who you're speaking to, but you do need the channel as well, right? Like at the end of the day, uh, people come onto social because they want to relax. Right? If I'm also targeting brand messaging there, they're not there for that objective. Absolutely. Right. So as a result of which channel is also very, very important. So it becomes channel specific there. <laughs> yeah. So that I, I don't think one can live without the other. I think the channel plus data is important uh, to find out what are you going to tell your consumer, right? So and the data will help you tell who you're speaking to. Uh, and what are their interests, etc. And also define your channel selection to a certain extent. So does not brand take the oh, back seat then? If we are to play and engage on different channels? So it depends again on the objective which I said, right? So if we're talking about engagement, I think we have to be there and like keep the engagement as top priority. So on social, and if you look at our social strategy, uh, we don't put out brand messaging. We, we keep it in the tone of social, it's largely memes and reels and whatever works in the social space. When we go to TV, 
for example, it needs to be tailored to TV, right? Like the TV creatives or TV ads have a specific format and it needs to work in that format. Uh, when we do digital, for example, it needs to be fast, like you need to be fast, quick and, you know, get your message out as soon as possible within, within 6 to 10 seconds. So I think it needs to be both uh, because if, if we didn't have the data, I wouldn't know who's watching TV and who's watching sure. digital and accordingly we wouldn't be able to target. I think uh, the other thing is just adding to what Sneha said, like the attention span is very varied across different boards. Uh, I think I am, let's say, if somebody's on Instagram, they are actually bombarded with 20 branded things and 200 non branded. And when, let's say, I am watching a cricket match, I know there's a match and then there are two ads and then there's the match again. So my receptiveness is very different. Uh, it kind of then goes to the fact that how do I kind of get your attention in those. 20 seconds, that 2 second of an Instagram post or a 6 second reel, where do I kind of slot myself and that becomes I think the more profound challenge that after hey, I figured out these are 20 channels I want to be at, now I don't know what's the attention span going to be. Digital still gives you that, a view through rate will give you hey, these many people watched in 25, 50, yes. 75, mm -hmm. but let's say when you go to something like an outdoor mm -hmm. or you go to something like a theatre. Uh, outdoor you'd say you have about what, 2 seconds, 3 seconds at best, how do you kind of customize according to that and let's say if you go to a theatre, there is no meter that's kind of measuring how many people saw what across the board. Uh, so I think at times it ends up also at a lot of gut cause if I were to say for lack of a better word uh, that hey you know what these folks are going to be here and let's take this call and kind of move on. Tell me have you ever had to compromise then what the brand really stands for? In that 20 seconds, in that 10 seconds? Uh, not really actually, I've actually always seen that and I take, I can take an example of multiple brands out here but let's say something like a Cred or a OnePlus or a PhonePay, mm -hmm. all of these are the three brands that I work for so I think you've always wanted to deliver what the message was and what the brand ethos are in those 20 seconds as you've kind of tried to always do that no matter what and I think that's one area where I genuinely feel none of us are compromising on because you need the channel 100% yes if you want to be there there is no chance you are compromising it's actually the onus resides on you to figure out hey how do I kind of fit in there I think that's the challenge because otherwise saying the basic stuff and getting away with brand dilution is the easiest way out thanks thanks for that I may add to that sure. right so uh, I think he's absolutely bang on you know the campaign objective kind of matters the most right a lot of times we kind of tell our uh, partners what is the best channel that they should adopt. Like a mini series of three episodes is very different from a reel that is 30 seconds, right? So while the reels are ephemeral and you can keep watching as many as they can be, the stickiness doesn't exist. Yeah. As opposed to a mini series of three episodes, people are coming back, they're kind of trying to get to know your product better. So the campaign objectives largely decides what can be done on each of these channels to, you know, actually make it something. To be able to make a mark of some sort. Uh, why don't I want to bring you in here because I know your category is one where uh, customization of furniture and you know of the interior spaces becomes very critical to a customer. What is your, have you kind of used personalization of furniture, of living spaces etc as a message if the brand is standing for that and um, how much have you got to do or in this area in terms of meeting what a customer exactly wants and things and diluting what the brand actually stands for. Is there an example that you want to share? Is there a story around this? So most of our comms as mentioned earlier as well Tina uh, has been on the primary category drivers which is quality of material and design right? Yes you mentioned. Uh, but having said our back end is customized to a very very great extent right? Um, we have over a million permutations and combinations for the same kitchen right? Uh, that's because every customer is different, every and the need state is different. And as a result, we have di you know diversified our you know or segmented our business units as well. We have a business unit which caters to the basic requirement of home interiors, right? For example, if someone buys a two BHK, I just get my kitchen, wardrobe, say a TV unit, a shoe rack, which is basic woodwork for me to move and fix furniture. The kind of designer you need there is very different. The kind of store you need over there is very different. The kind of catalog you need there is very different. Similarly, if someone is doing a full home interior and they're spending say about 80 lakhs on the same home, the kind of designer again you need is very different. So we have personalized our entire supply side to cater to the customer's need state, right? Uh, but at the top of the funnel, 
we attract or rather bring in audiences with the same tenet which is quality of material which science. is quality of so there you are maintaining an umbrella message yes, and consistency yes. in that yeah. okay another question to all of you and one or two answers are welcome uh, why is it important to be consistent why should the brand be consistent at all why don't i play across different channels as per or product need whatever yeah, yeah. so uh, the best example is a brand is like a human being right and uh, say a brand behaves like a specific person today and behaves like a different person tomorrow. It's schizophrenic in nature, right? It's not normal. Uh, while as, as brand custodians, right, it's important for us to create that consistency because for consumers, brand is not important, right? That's the last thing on their mind, right? So how do you get the attention, right? Being consistent over years, that's what good brands do, right? The same messaging, probably narrated in a different story, yes. right? And that's what brings consistency and memorability for consumers, right? So, uh, so therefore, you should be consistent. You know, I was actually doing research at one point for an Atta brand, and I realized that women buy Atta at the drop of a hat and switch an Atta brand at the drop of a hat. There's no love for the brand that you have been using for su such a long time. Yeah. And my, in my experience, I think <laughs> that brand. Uh, consistency or expression becomes almost second nature, becomes hygiene after a certain point, becomes comfort. And there it becomes important to say, I will choose because I know there is surety of whatever the uh, brand stands for. So you want to come in here? One point that I wanted to add here was that at the end, any category you go to, there's a lot of clutter, right? There are yeah. so many brands. The products can be similar in a lot of ways also. And that's where the emotional essence comes into play, right? Well For said. consumers to um, relate to a specific brand. Um, of course, I'm in a high value category, so uh, people do spend a lot of time versus an Ata brand, uh, FMCG. Yeah. Yeah. It will definitely be different, but there also I see a lot of brands creating that emotional connect, connect with customers. And that's where the brand identity comes into play. And uh, there can be different aspects of it, whether it's emotion, whether it's um, you know um, environmental um, um, related um, you know aspects that consumers in today's world want to uh, associate with a brand that is doing something good or uh, um, you know striking a chord with their um, inner self, right? So that is also very important to create. Um, that's the reason why we should uh, kind of be consistent in our messaging because the, then the consumer can differentiate you in that clutter of you know, all Absolutely. different, uh, similar kind of products Absolutely. in the market. Right? And we see it in some of the most loved brands. I mean, we give an example of Swiggy and I'm so sorry that Zomato always comes in when we talk about Swiggy. But, uh, you know, uh, Indigo and such brands, and they've done a lot in this category and unfortunately, fortunately, uh, Tanishq has done so much in this category as well. But Sneha, you so want Tina, to say one point. Uh, just recently I was reading, we can debate about what makes great brands, etc. At the end of the day, a brand is about what a consumer tells his or her friend, her in, friend a, in a close room, case. right? So, and the stronger a personality, so for example, you made that strong personality, it's, it forms memory structures that you will talk about. I think, to me, that's essentially why, why it's important that you are that one personality that people like what Varun was saying, right? So, uh, uh, it's it's as simple as that. Uh, if if you think Kamal, you will think of the girl that you've seen forever and ever. So it is memory structures, and some part of it is the comfort that you build, Very and true. the fact that you know that this is what you're going to get out of the brand. This yes. is what you're going to get out of that brand. That's true. So, um, Rith, you I were telling me about trust. I want I to. I think a lot of it is kind of then stemming from the kind of category that you are in, also. Uh, Let's say you in the jewelry category, you need to be super high on trust. Uh, I think there are other categories where people are comfortable trying out new brands, like you mentioned, Ata. But there are some places where you would never compromise on, like your money, which is where the banking system. So your also industry as well. I mean, for phone pay, trust is a big one. Exactly. So I think for a lot of, I think if that's true for most financial institutions. That where I feel comfortable with is where I kind of put my money out as well. So I think, but again, that's stemming from the fact that, hey, what is my involvement in the category? What is my involvement with the product? Uh, and that is where you, let's say the trust, how okay are you in letting go of it or how okay are you in staying close to it is kind of coming in. Um, any areas where you've kind of um, translated that messaging of trust? Because your business would work on that. I think trust is that underlying thing in every simple thing that you're doing. For example, let's say even if you open up the home screen, the first thing it tells you about is all the security measures that the app is taking up and it's just on your load screen. 
So Very important touch I think point it just starts food. from there. Yeah. And it literally goes every single point that you've got afterwards. So I think it's not a, I genuinely feel it's not a marketing first initiative. It's actually a product first initiative because I can say anything that I may want and then probably it's, if the product is not as much, it won't make a difference. Sure. So I think we are actually gift wrapping what everybody else is doing at the back end. I think a whole economy has started on, on the basis of trust, which is Rahul will be able to uh, elaborate more, is on the uh, influencer economy, right? That Lovely. builds on trust and that is obviously, you know, earlier there were the big influencers and then there were micro-influencers which have come up and micro-influencers nothing but you and me kind of people who are just saying that, you know, this product works this brand works and this is an amazing product and that's how it is. So, um, the interesting that you bring this up and especially because you know you have Snapchat as a platform that you will uh, uh, prof propagate as well. Uh, give us some examples of uh, how a brand has been able to create meaningful engagement or meaningful communication or content on Snapchat because that's not a very well uh, used platform in, by Indian brands. Yeah, so Snap is also about, um, you, we were talking about, you know, native advertising, native Sure. When I say native that, you know, uh, how do you natively, uh, naturally come and not be an ad, ad per se, right? Yeah. Very intrusive, not to be intrusive. Uh, and Snap beautifully does that, right? With its augmented reality, etc. And the ethos of actually augmented reality is that you as a user are also a brand ambassador, right? When a brand, uh, you know, a, a sponsored lens, etc., is happening, you're putting your face on it and saying that, hey, you know, this is the product that works. So we, for example, we did uh, a large campaign for Flipkart, okay. uh, and they were promoting, you know, um, products, uh, faster delivery, best prices, etc. And I think uh, they they had Alia Bhatt, which was from a trust factor, you know, a very large influencer. And they were using the platform, right? And the platform, what we did was, we said that everyone can become a, and Alia Bhatt was called Flip Girl, right? Flip card, Flip Girl, right? Who is basically fast, trustworthy, etc. We said, hey, everyone can become a Flip Girl. And we created this entire augmented reality lens where when the user opened it, they saw their face as the Flip Girl and they could share that uh, entire engagement with their friends. And we got like amazing. We had almost 15 seconds to 20 seconds of engagement on just that branded piece of content, right? Excellent. Is, and uh, you see more and more brands doing this. Any of you on the panel? And uh, Rahul, have you done it for some brands? Yeah, absolutely, right? So uh, I think Instagram filters and Snap filters are gated, but you know, we've been talking to them to try and help fill them out. Uh, but Instagram filters, we've done quite a few, uh, where we believe that one is to use your set of influencers to send the messaging out, right? Mm -hmm. But does that drive organic adoption? If it does and there are people actually participating in the campaign to make it larger, it is successful. So uh, one of these, let's say for example, one of the shows that we produced for uh, Z5, right? So it's called Ahana Pilanta, which is still one of the largest shows and very closest to our hearts uh, off late. So when we started doing this, we were like, this is a show that everybody can watch, right? But how do you communicate this to everybody? You can't have a similar strategy for everybody, right? You have your push notifications, you have your outdoor, you have your uh, newspaper ads, and then there's a huge part of digital and what can be done around it. Hmm. So we started off by seeding a song into Instagram. Into where there Instagram. was a book step where you know these guys actually did and it got 15,000 organic reels that were produced using that okay. audio track, right? Okay. Now that for us was a very strong feedback that you know if you can drive organic options. And if when you were seeding it, what was your strategy? I want you to share with our audiences. What did you do to start seeding that? Well, for seeding, you know, one, uh, basically we, the actors themselves were big stars, so they started the trend and uh, then we have an army of influencers who work exclusively with us, right? But so you must have obviously looked at the personality of the show and chosen similar types of absolutely influencers. Absolutely, because it was very important that the show had a certain persona, right? And yes. we, had to true, we had to stay true to it. So the kind of creators that we picked, the kind of communication that we had them say when they were making reels to sample the show, the kind of way they danced for a specific step. Everything was actually, you know, keeping in tact the actual brand persona of the show, which Absolutely. is, you know, the whole personalization that we wanted this to be viewed a certain way. 
So you mentioned an important point over here and I think uh, Varun touched upon it. How much do we lose our brand essence when we are personalizing for audiences? And personalization could be across geography, across target segments, across um, you know uh, different uh, categories of buyers and things. It's not necessary to lose your personality, right? Um, your brand has a certain tone of voice, it has a certain personality. The mediums are different, but the tone of voice stays the same, right? It could be from different content also. For example, advertising, right? A 20 second, uh, it's a certain type of content, but your tone of voice is the same. At the same time, you work with an influencer, your tone of voice is still the same, right? Uh, or you do long form content for probably a show, a five series show, your tone of voice is again the same. So that's what keeps the brand consistent. Yeah. Yeah. So you feel personalization doesn't really then, uh, it's not as detrimental to a brand voice? Or no, the personalization is important, but uh, important, it's yes. important. But yeah. having said that, the, if the tone of voice is the same, you're not losing out on anything. And there's a good marketer at the end of that, Varun, because not many brands are able to maintain it. But it's really hard, Tina. It's like really hard. If, we, if I, I, I want to maintain my tone of voice, but I can't use the same creative in a Bangalore as well as a Bidai. How do I maintain that dynamism that, the, you know, what our core of our brand stands for? How do we do that in multiple markets is really hard and I don't think there's a silver bullet really answer that absolutely. we've come up with. Which is why we're on this panel <laughs> discussing this. So okay, talking about ahead. personalization, also, um, we have to realize that when it comes to personalization, you're not personalizing the brand for the customer. You're trying to personalize the product or the service, right? And that's where um, the tweak in communication comes. And of course, uh, first party data helps over there. What is the person browsing accordingly? What are the recommendations I give to them? What kind of emails I send to a cohort of customers who buy a category of products or uh, a, a specific price range of products, right? So there are different means and ways of personalizing um, and uh, you know sharing different kinds of uh, messages to customers without diluting brand identity as well. And, uh, and I actually do believe that a brand is an amalgamation of a whole lot of things, a whole lot of attributes. At every touch point, you may not be able to enliven every attribute. So you've got to make a pick based on certain factors that uh, you're less suggesting. Okay, I think we have about five, seven minutes more. So I'm going to... Um, you know, quickly ask you all to just tell me, if you were to take a leaf out of anyone else's book, any other brand, which brand would you look to in terms of saying, okay, they've done it really well, and I like the way this brand is consistently representing themselves. And just a couple of names and maybe campaigns that our audiences can look through, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, this is a wonderful brand. It's a fruit drink brand called Innocent. Uh, it's based out of UK. Uh, yes. If you look at their communication, look at their packaging, look at their office, look at their value system, look at the policy that they have for employees. It's yeah. all the same. Okay, uh, homework for all of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Varun. Uh, two examples from me. I would love to have the kind of budgets budgets that Barbie had. Oh yes, <laughs> of it course. It was a marketing masterclass. Yes. Uh, but really amazing job. But closer home. Uh, I think Whole Truth Foods does a really great job, like a consistent story across every touch point, whether it's a bill, whether it's packaging, whether it's the yes. social. So these two are my favorite. Thank you. And I have a story, an anecdote on that because we are pink lemonade. And uh, uh, two weeks ago when I was uh, representing us somewhere else, they said, uh, you've got to change that pink lemonade. I said, no, that's the color that's trending right now. Why would I? <laughs> so that's, anyway, come Ritij. I think one is a slightly wild example of some the way Apple's kind of communicated privacy to everyone. I think we didn't know that was a problem until they started to say so. Absolutely. And uh, the other thing, and I think that's again a, a, a more uh, Indian sort of an example, is I think HDFC Bank. We don't see a lot of that communication coming out, but I think when you hear HDFC, you, you know what it's going to do it for you. Yes. And I think uh, they've done a Good job at it, a great job as a matter of fact. Thank you and I'm so, uh, you know, happy to see that the brands that you all are mentioning out here, it's very clear that they're successful because of doing what they've done consistently and well and they've transcended to across customer segments. It goes back to the consistency across every channel. And absolutely, absolutely. They are where they are. Yeah. Rahul? So for me, I pretty much drive past IKEA every day when I go to work, right? Lovely. And when you look at what IKEA does, I mean, you know, you can buy it on their site, you know, pick it up from their store, 
don't get loyalty points. So the whole way in which they've kind of brought in all of these jams together, and then them trying to also kind of go a little sustainable. I think, you know, the way they're kind of catching up to trends, because I think today it's important, like we also have another company called the Indian Peacock, where we do men's clothing line, where it's, it's actually directly sourced from the people, right? So sustainability is not a fad, right? It's a trend, and that's, you know, picking up and it's getting, and it's evolving Absolutely. over a period of time. Important. And the way IKEA has kind of done that, and their communication messaging across, I think it's a brilliant way they've done it. Very nice. And while we're on IKEA, I want to take it to Live Space again, because uh, you mentioned to me recently you have a store in uh, Singapore where you are co-branded with uh, IKEA. Yeah, How do you then bring out the Live Space brand when IKEA is this mammoth sitting there and you know so difficult to? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So in fact, it, it's the very first uh, co-branded store by IKEA anywhere in the world, right? And it's it's a need of the day, right? Um, so IKEA is great in fixed in you know in furniture, but they have a standard design. But consumers' need states are changing and they want personalization, they want different needs. And that's the reason why they collaborated, right? And we have a very, very good proposition. Obviously, the might of IKEA's brand comes there. And as a result, we, we, we stick the catalog of IKEA, but we do heavy levels of personalization. So uh, you have Live Space uh, visibly present there? Yeah, absolutely. It's a co-branded, yes. Co-branded, you, yeah, co -branded, it's, you it's said, co -branded, yes, that's yes. right. So do you play customization there or you still play quality? There it's, it's, the market in Singapore is slightly different and uh, therefore we actually pitch and the nature of service also is more about personalization. So yeah, we pitch personalization. So then you are customizing to that. Yeah, yeah, it's not for the specific thing. Sure. But the, but, the, but the niche states are very different. For example, we are also present in Saudi Arabia. The uh -huh. niche state in Saudi Arabia is very, very different, right? Uh, the, the level of premiumness is very, very different. Very there, different, yes. Right? Yes. Uh, and the, or, and, the, and the platforms that they consume is also very, very different. And for example, Google doesn't exist there. <laughs> right? uh, Snap is actually their primary platform. They use yes. Snap for search or Insta for search. So, so the platforms that you reach out to customers in different countries also vary. It, and therefore what Sneha was saying, it's very tough because you've got to change at some point then. You've yeah. got to allow a few things to happen. Uh, yes, Ashni, you want to come in? Your favorites? Mm, I um, admire this brand called Patagonia also. Okay sustainability they had a campaign where they spoke about uh, don't buy this jacket because you know reuse what you have and then talking about how reusable materials recycled materials have been used so and it was again across um, channels okay. so yeah lovely but we look into it thank you Akshay? yeah I think uh, for me from an omni channel perspective and a very mass brand has been dominant lovely. for some reason right yes uh, they are present you know in stores they have you know uh, an app, they have a website, they are on MWeb. Uh, you know, some people would know and some won't that you could also order a Domino's Pizza through an Alexa app, right, which is voice. Uh, and there's consistency in the fact that they want to deliver fast. Uh, and it is from the fact that anywhere uh, was one of their campaigns that you could order from anywhere and which is actually consistent with the Omni channel. Thank you for sharing that example and uh, on that note I just want to share a, um, you know, a fact that Domino's is the only brand I hear on Swiggy which is allowed to do its own delivery and doesn't share data with Swiggy and uh, you know so I have to say the brand has then overpowered and uh, made its presence felt so thanks for that example. Any questions from the audience I would love to yes we have a couple of people there so can someone give them a mic please. Um, there's this sudden shift in messaging uh, from being centered around small elite to now being uh, changed into users, uh, next the next half million users, right? So uh, with, with reference to this expanding uh, omnipresent channels that brands have started to use, how, uh, what kind of content formats or what kind of strategies are we looking at to provide this ex inclusive experience from uh, for users who are now entering from say tier three, tier four cities. So I think it will go back to uh, where we started, right? Um, so if I have to talk about Swiggy in specific, we are at around like forty percent penetration in the big cities. We are in maybe like the early uh, double digits in in smaller cities. So 
honestly for us the wave of growth is coming from the smaller cities as a result of which it is important for us to be able to be relevant to that market right so couple of things change couple of things don't what doesn't change is what our brand stands for what does Swiggy bring to the table at the end of the day we bring convenience to your life so that you can have a better life right so that's the consistent part of it and whatever we do no matter what the channel uh, no matter what the messaging I think that part of it will be intrinsic to what we do uh, in terms of I think where this will play out is in terms of the media selection in terms of like like I was talking about right like languages we will move from say for example speaking the social speak to being able to speak in Malayalam or Tamil or whatever is the language that we want to uh, you know or like be more um, relevant to the TG that we are speaking to I think these are the two things that one thing like I said one thing will change and one thing won't uh, but honestly that's how we can grow. Uh, Seha, that's a very valid point in terms of uh, localization of that content or making it more inclusive to tier 3. Have any of you uh, tried to look at AI and how that can create a touch point that or a moment of truth that's uh, pervasive in a local language? Uh, I know we did something for Swiggy that for the uh, Homely campaign. So yeah, we have done AI but again it was not tier 3 focused. It was it not was tier 3 largely, focused. Uh, tier 1. We do actually like a lot of our performance marketing. For example, if you are in a Bilai or a uh, Bhopal, the kind of uh, items that you would see for my performance marketing is very different and it's actually tailored to what your tastes are. Very nice. Um, so, honestly, I think there's no escaping it and AI is already... <laughs> yeah, and even ML, right? Like if you open your app, what you see on Swiggy will be very different uh, Like in, right now if, sure. you, if you open the app here. So. Sure, thank you. We have another question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My question is related to, uh, I mean, directed to any of the panelists. See, we, we have spoken a lot about only MNC companies as such. So uh, here, uh, I'd like to know, see how Patanjali has uh, done uh, against uh, biggies like uh, Hindustan, Unilever, Procter and Gamble, Colgate, and all that, and uh, they haven't uh, used the celebrities also. Baba Ramdev himself has done a great job. He's the biggest so, celebrity for see, them. You can see that uh, how uh, this uh, brand equity has been developed in the kitchen. Any comments to be made on this? Uh, I'll so, ask the panelists for... So like Patanjali actually is a beautiful brand because of the consistency of the brand ambassador, the owner itself, right? Ramdev, uh, he has a certain personality, he has certain attributes, certain attitudes and as a result he's entered categories also of a similar nature and attributes of the products are also of similar nature. So there's significant consistency from his personality to his product range and yeah, that's the reason why you see his success there as well, right? So Huge consistency and absolutely what he's saying is the products are allied to his way of life, his belief and therefore they consumed also as natural progression. Please, any others? Sentiments? Thoughts? I think we were just having this conversation a little while ago in the uh, <coughs> speaker's panel room as well, right? So when you have a person who has a personality that you know you already you know believe in, then selling the product becomes so much easier because the trust and the emotion that you get with it becomes pretty much you know uh, seamless. I think great example of content marketing, sir. Every day your content marketing on a certain way of life, and all the products are aligned with that. So talk about Lalita Jewelers, actually. You know, he's Lalita Jewelers. Yeah. He's, uh, he's also yeah, a classic yeah, example yeah. of that. Right? having that call. Thank you. Yes, sir. Please come in. Uh, the gentleman on the first. Yes, please go ahead then. Yeah, uh, with the advent of uh, AA and ML, uh, no, obviously we have Omnichannel uh, followed by all the brands and companies. But uh, uh, considering a few companies like, you know, Free Charge, Cred, or, uh, you know, Milk Basket, those companies, they, they, have, they use only chat. I mean, only one channel. So, with the with the with AI and ML in the coming years or in the future, do we see only few channels uh, for marketing or omni-channel? So I'm not sure Milk Basket and the others would use only one channel of communication. The app itself would be an in-house channel. I mean, with proprietary channel for them. But there so would be other channels. Even GeoMart, for example, recently you could place orders through WhatsApp. So, yeah. I think it is it is definitely inevitable. I think how people uh, place orders, how they react. I, I am talking about actually customer care, sorry. Customer, customer care, care channels. Customer okay. care channels. Okay. I mean. 
So yeah, even there, so I just believe the chat is actually AI driven, right? Their AI bots that are still. So customer care, at least uh, our experience at uh, LiveSpace has been that how fast we can respond to the customer, at least to hear him out or her out, right? I think that's very important. Uh, when, why do people come to the customer care if there's a certain escalation, if there's something not in line with what their experience was? So uh, we, the way we see it is which channel can hear them out and respond back to them immediately, right? So while AI and ML does the job of hearing them out, right? Okay, fine. Uh, we have a decision tree matrix and Okay, your name, your project name, what's your concern? Immediately after that, it goes back to traditional channels, at least in this space, because you need a human being to understand what's happening on the project site, right? Uh, AI can't do that, so, uh, because there could be some escalation there. And then we have a person reaching out to that person. Biggest uh, channel actually for that has been Twitter, right? Like, I remember when we were talking to Airtel, they were very, very skeptical on coming on Twitter at some point of time. But eventually they had to because all the escalation and customer grievances used to come on Twitter, right? And Twitter then later on developed chatbots which are AI driven, you know, which brands could use and they could auto respond on customer grievances. So yeah, it's, it's been a trend that's... But to answer your question, I think uh, the brands will have to keep themselves open to listening to customers wherever a customer is because and they'll have to consolidate that in some way, whether it's through AI or uh, you know anything else. Uh, do we have time for any more questions? No, right? No. Okay, so I'm so sorry, but we will have to close here. Um, you're free to meet our panelists uh, <laughs> offline. Thank you so much for your time and thank you panelists.